Testing, testing. Sibilant, Randy. Sibilant. <laughs> Never gets old. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all as we get ready to worship this morning. I uh, will invite you to get out your In the Life of the Church insert while you were doing that. Good morning, Facebook and all the internet. We're really glad that you were with us this morning as well and hope you're having a great day. Um, okay, several things to point out to you in the In the Life of the Church. And, and I'm going to kind of cue some of these up. Um, where we're going in the sermon today, you know, we're in this series about fascination with God, and we're going to be talking about how our sorrows inspire fascination with God. And one of the things that we do here is we're here to serve people who are hurting. And so uh, we have a number of events, actually, that are queued up to help serve those who are hurting. So you take a look at um, the butterfly release coming up this Saturday. Wings of Love Butterfly release designed for those who are grieving and mourning. And so this is your op great opportunity, if you are in that place, to come and to uh, receive, some, you know, receive some support and encouragement, but also a great opportunity for you to invite people who are needing that support and encouragement. So that's coming up this Saturday at 9.30. If you'd like to RSVP a butterfly, let us know. Um, use the Connect card or message us in the church office. Yet another way that we support those who are hurting is through the arts, because the arts can be a way of lifting and encouraging and strengthening uh, the hurting heart. And so coming up later this month, we have Carrie Patrick Clark. Uh, that's in partnership with our friends at the Downtown Listening Room, a positive, encouraging singer-songwriter. It's going to be a really terrific um, opportunity. So uh, that's going to be Saturday, September 28th at 7 o'clock. We've got some info cards in the entry foyer, you can pick those up. A great opportunity for you to invite someone that might be going through a difficult time. To just invite them to a warm, uplifting show. And then um, also theater. We have the Lamplight Theater Company that's putting on the production of It's a Wonderful Life, a show all about the hurting heart. A man who is just driven to extreme measures, and he receives a message from the Lord that his life has value and his life has impact. It's going to be a marvelous show, and that would be a great opportunity for you to encourage uh, someone with a hurting heart. And I believe tickets are on sale in the entry foyer. Mary Beth will be glad to talk with you all about that. So all of these things are ways that you can encourage the hurting heart, um, and I invite you to take advantage of those. Uh, okay, we're here to worship. We are here to turn our hearts once again to the Lord. As usual, we're going to take a few minutes of time where we're going to be st still and lay down all the things that are turning in our heart before the Lord. Um, on the back of your order of worship, we've got that abide time thing. If you have stuff that you just need to jot out just to get it out of your brain, you can jot that in the uh, area on the back of the page. Uh, but I invite you now to prepare, to be ready to meet with the Lord, the Lord who loves you, the Lord who calls you by name, the Lord who he suffered too, and he identifies with you in your suffering. So let's take a few moments, and let's be still and prepare our hearts to worship.
And on that day when my heart is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing this praise unending. Let's stand and sing together.
each other and greet each other with the love of our heart's desire, Jesus Christ.
Good morning. What a privilege it is to gather together to worship the Lord, to be with God's people. We are the community of Jesus Christ, called to love him, follow him, and experience his love. Let us continue in worship. Let us pray. Lord, we bless you this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, and don't forget any of his benefits. Lord, you are gracious, you are merciful, you are compassionate, you are slow to anger. You are abounding in loving kindness. In this world that you have made, you are present everywhere in grace and peace, in forgiveness, in care and compassion. We come to you this morning, we bring our hearts to you, we bring our hearts to this place. We call out for your spirit to touch us, to fill us, to soothe us, and to comfort us. Our God, we confess that we need you. We are dependent upon you. We long for you. We rest in you. We worship you this morning. Lord, we're in a world that's needy and hurting, whether it's chaos and wars in various places or uh, weather events which stress people's lives. We, we are a needy people. And so we come to you for help. We have no illusions of independence or, uh, or self-deliverance. We come to you as our deliverer. We come to you as people in need. Lord, in a world that's full of pain, we pray that your spirit would bring grace and peace and compassion to those who are hurting everywhere for those who are feeling guilty and facing um, their own sin. We pray that your grace to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord, would fill their hearts, soothe their hearts, cleanse their hearts, and comfort their hearts. We breathe deeply of your spirit this morning. We rest in you. We come to you, Lord, with a prayer that uh, you gave us to pray as we all say together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Ross, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. So as we come now to the time of the offering, uh, as you know, I normally ask you to ponder and consider how is God gonna be working through you this week, and just to be open to how God is gonna be working through you this week. Uh, today, I'm just gonna layer into that just a small invitation, a challenge. Today, we're gonna be talking about how our sorrows can inspire fascination with God. And every single one of us knows people who are carrying sorrows for one reason or another. It may be grief, it may be mourning, it may be they're just going through a really hard time, it may be that they're just prone towards melancholy. Every single one of us knows. I'm gonna invite you to just think of two or three names that might benefit from just a simple word of encouragement. And as you think of those, if, if, if you're uh, accepting this invitation, you can just jot those names on the back of your bulletin in that little space in the abide time. And my challenge to you would be this, that maybe even before you leave church today, just drop a simple text saying, thinking about you, praying for you. I know you're carrying a lot right now. Maybe even ask, how can I help? Or how can I encourage you? Just a simple way that you can be an encouragement and a blessing. And just to give testimony to the power of that, my friend Phil, who has been a dear friend for a long time, 
texts me every Sunday morning. He says, Russell, I'm praying for you today. And he does one sentence custom prayer of, you know, may God's power and presence be with you in a mighty way. That lifts my spirits more than you can ever know. Do not underestimate the small, simple act of just a simple text message. Or for those who are not texters, a simple phone call <laughs> um, to, to, to offer that encouragement and support. So think about that. Think about other ways that God may be working through you this week as his instrument of blessing as we receive today's tithe and offering. and generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the land your name is the highest your
morning. Our scripture today comes from Psalm 42, verses 1 through 11. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food. Day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why, dis why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God, which you have set in place and the fish, uh, and the fish in the sea all that swim in the paths of the sea. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And may God add his blessing to the reading and to the teaching of his word. Amen. Okay, so we are continuing this series through, uh, about fascination with God, the idea of drawing close to God, God not being a distant concept that we hold at a distance, but a living person, a being with whom uh, we have a divine encounter. And not just a living person and being with whom we have a divine encounter, a immense, awesome, majestic, fascinating being that, uh, that is worth our contemplation and growing to know. And, and so we started, we, we, we talked about how God reveals himself in creation and the wonders and the glories of creation and that inspires a deeper fascination with the creator and we saw not just the natural world but also human beings as, as bear, bearing God's divine image and how that inspires fascination with God. Last week we talked about the Lord's Supper and then just the mysteries of, of, how, of what Christ did for us. Christ's sacrifice of himself and how that draws us into this awestruck fascination with the living God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit who redeems us. So this week, we're going uh, to a slightly more challenging thing. Actually, a lot more challenging thing, our sorrows. A lot of times we, we want to just pass off, you know, get rid of our sorrows. We want to get past our sorrows. We want to deny our sorrows or forget our sorrows. But I suggest to you that our sorrows in Scripture, I think this particular passage, uh, which is very pre a precious psalm to me, um, it points us to that our sorrows can be a path to a deeper fascination with God. The Psalms teach us that it's normal to hurt, it's normal to feel abandoned by God. They teach us how we process these feelings. Our human temptation is to deny them, to get, get rid of them as soon as possible. And that's not what the Psalms teach. The Psalms show us a heart that honestly wrestles with their sorrows and through the wrestling finds a pathway to a deeper, richer, relationship with the living God. They teach us, the Psalms teach us how to process our sorrows through a position of faith. And, you know, I know sometimes I get folks to say, you know, I know I shouldn't feel this way. Christians don't feel this way. No, 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 no. Feelings are just feelings. But you don't have to stuff your feelings away. Neither do you have to let your feelings be dumped onto everyone around you. 
You don't have to suck it up and just get over it. Neither do you have to be paralyzed by your feelings. The Psalms teach us how to process our feelings from a spiritual way. C.S. Lewis, and I know it's almost cliche to quote C.S. Lewis, but I rather love C.S. Lewis, uh, very famously in The Problem of Pain, said, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Probably the most quoted passage from that book, probably the passage that everybody knows from that book. Read the whole book. It's a wonderful book, The Problem of Pain. But uh, the idea of our sorrows, our pains, become a way to connect with God. And this psalm takes us on that journey. <clears throat> and so let's just dig into the psalm and let's, uh, let's explore it a little bit. And, and, I, and I like to, you know, psalms are wonderful little gems. They're, they're, they're artistic, poetic pieces. You, you approach them differently than you would, say, the letters of Paul. The letters of Paul you know, become this, this kind of logical, laying out argumentation. Psalms are works of art. They're poetic experiences to, to evoke things. And, and so um, here, at the very beginning, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? And so we get this evocative imagery of this deer in a desert, dry land, searching for water. If you've been to the, or you've seen you know, in, in film or video, the desert wastes of Judea, you can easily imagine uh, where, there, where streams are just small, they're called wadis that go between these massive, rugged hill country. And, and usually it's just a small trickle, unless there's a rainstorm, in which case it's a, a rushing uh, flood through these valleys. But you know, during a dry time, it's just a small trickle. Can imagine being this, the, 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 the searching, the longing of the deer. And so it's using this evocative imagery to express his soul, the hunger, the thirst, the longing for encounter with God. Now he begins with the longing. And that's what we sang in, in you know, the very famous worship song, as the deer pants for the water. And it's talking about the, the longing. But here we see that the longing is tied in this psalm to sorrow. That's the sorrow that inspires this longing. Verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? And so there's this, this sense of abandonment. The longing is because he feels like he's lost something that he has experienced before. And there's this thirst for more contact with the living God. You see, that's very powerful because, again, we get this idea that, well, I should always feel joyful and amazing and fantastic. I'm a Christian, I'm redeemed, I'm saved. I should always be floating on a cloud. That is not life and that is not the biblical picture at all. Here, we have this wrestling with this sense of abandonment. I mean, he's gonna explore this. You know, the psalm is gonna keep coming back to this in, in deeper and deep, deeper ways. But hear this, you should expect in a, in a spiritual life, you should expect seasons of dryness, difficulty, of looking out on the cosmos and going, where are you, God? We have these, we may have these wonderful, rich times of sweetness, these rich times where you just feel God with you, where you feel the Holy Spirit with you, you know, and you were certain. But then those times move on as a normal part of the spiritual life. 16th century John, uh, mystic John of the Cross 
uh, explores this. He wrote his uh, book, the, the Dark Knight of the Soul. And do not be confused, he's not talking about Bruce Wayne as the Dark Knight. Thank you for the polite laughter. Um, no, he's, he's talking about the, the idea of, of this dryness. And he talks about how God in his love will remove that sense of his presence. Why? Because he's teaching us to hunger only for him, not just for the benefits, not just for the goodies, not just for the, the warm feeling that we get. And I think, you know, some of this is also, it becomes very easy to make an idolatry out of religious observance, right? You know, we can have great worship music and it can just be lifting our heart and soul, but then if we come in and we feel dry, then it's very easy to, to well, the band's just not doing it for me anymore. Well, that's not the case. It's not about the band or the little preacher or the stuff. It's what are you experiencing right now? How are you bringing it to the Lord? How are you experiencing it? How are you hungering for the Lord? Sometimes it should be a normal part of the Christian life that God will remove those feelings of richness all to inspire a deeper hunger. Uh, John LaCrosse puts it this way, in general, the soul makes greater progress when it least thinks so, yea, most frequently when it imagines that it is losing. Can you believe that in your times of sorrow, weariness, when you are looking out and you're just like, I just can't go on, it's taking all I can to put one foot in front of the other, that that is where God is growing you the most? I mean, we understand this in physical training. You, know, you, you, you push yourself. When you reach exhaustion, that's when your muscles are growing. Uh, how much more true is it spiritually? How much more true is it spiritually? When you heat, reach that dryness, that, that is a place where the Holy Spirit comes in and carries you in ways that you never even imagined. And so here, he's crying out, you know, my soul... You know, my tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? And in that, crying out in sense of abandonment, he shares that with God. And things happen. Verse 4, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. You see, this is the process. It's not stuffing it away. It's not dumping it on other people. It's pouring it out to God. You realize the amazing privilege that we have, that we can go to the creator of the universe and kvetch and whine and moan and cry and, and pour out all of these things that are just churning within us. We don't even really know how to express. I mean, I don't know about you, but a lot of times I get tongue-tied when I'm trying to explain to somebody kind of my own internal weirdnesses, you know, and, and it comes out incoherent and I don't really feel like I'm being understood. But God, who sees all, knows all, experiences all, knows you better than yourself, he already knows. You pour your mess out before him. It's him helping you process through it. So as you pour out your soul before God, this is the privilege that we have in prayer. Prayer is not simply well, let me go through my checklist and pray for, you know, this person's uh, bad leg and this person's got COVID and, you know, this person and, oh, we need, you know, the church needs this event to go well. Prayer's not necessarily a checklist. You know, I want you to pray for specific things. But prayer, at deepest, is conversation with God where you are pouring out your inner stuff, saying, God, where are you? God, I don't know what to do with this mess. I'm so frustrated. I'm so upset. I'm so lonely. I'm just pouring it out before God. Pour out your soul to him. And, so, you know, he, and, and, and in the pouring out, 
God, in this instance, uses memory. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Memory. In this case, God bringing up those memories of times in the past where he showed his goodness, his faithfulness. In this instance, in worship. But it could be in any other instance. So many times... When I've felt isolated, misunderstood, lonely, frustrated, despairing, and I've gone to the Lord pouring out my isolation, my loneliness, my frustration, my despair, and I may have been feeling within that, yeah, I just, you know, I, I just want to take a nap for like a month. Um, and many times, not always, but many times in those prayers, God refreshes a memory, an experience, a time when I experienced his power, his presence, his person in a real and tangible way. You've heard me tell many of these stories, but... Uh, God will bring those back and say, no, you're not alone. You are my beloved son. You're cherished. You're going to be okay. You'll get through this season. The memory oftentimes becomes an instrument through which God brings us through sorrows. And we see a hint of that. Why, verse 5, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. And so we get this, this verse 5, which, okay, there's a little bit of a lift there, right? A bounce. But then what's so interesting is it goes back. My soul is, verse 6, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizarn. So, so again, the psalm is showing this undulation, it's not, I've brought my sorrows to the Lord in prayer. I've got a little bit of relief. Ha ha, everything's better. No. Sometimes our sorrows are so heavy, they keep coming back. It's not that the prayer didn't work. It's, you know, please do not think that you know, prayer is some kind of magic genie thing where you rub the bottle, oh, I'm sorrowful, here's your wish, poof, sorrow is gone. That's not how it works. You share this with the Lord. There's a little bit of, in, in this instance, and in many times, a little bit of relief. But sometimes the sorrows come back and you persist in bringing them to the Lord. That's the picture that we get in this psalm. Jesus tells a wonderful parable in Luke. It's, a, it's, a, it's right there in Luke 18. It's um, one of his lesser known parables, but I think it's a fascinating one, the parable of the persistent widow. Um, just listen to this. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So it's not just one time prayer and then we're done. Ha ha, I got what I want. Don't give up. He said this, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. So you see, I mean, Luke tells us the parable is there. It tells to persist in prayer. A parable about an unjust judge. If in the story an unjust judge eventually relents, how much more so a God who is our father and calls us his beloved children will listen to us. Listen. Our call is to persist 
in prayer. The persistence in give, bringing our sorrows to the Lord. In hope, in faith, that the process of sharing again and again and again is the pathway to healing and abundant life. Okay, so you know, the, the psalm continues you know, because you know, he persists in, in this. Um, there's more memory. And then we get to probably the verses that capture me the most. Verses 7 and 8. Take a look at these. Uh, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, and at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Now that, that gets back to pretty rich poetry, in which I dig. I'm into this kind of stuff. But, but it's just the imagery. Deep calls to deep. And we've had the nature imagery before. Uh, you know, as a, the, the image that comes to my mind, and this goes back to my first trip to Israel when I was able to go up to the headwaters of the River Jordan. Uh, you know, and, and there in the area of Banyas, there's this mighty rushing waterfall and this lush, lush park in Israel. Uh, it's a lush forested park. You know, it's like going to Mount Airy Forest, but more foresty. And, uh, and that's you know, one of the major headwaters for the River Jordan. And you know, I can just imagine as you, you know, as you sit before this mighty waterfall, my heart becomes stilled. And I envision the deeps of that waterfall, the roar, the rush, the rush of the water, and how that stirs a deeper fascination with God. And those deeps that we experience in creation call out to the deeps within the human heart. To, to me, this, you know, this just speaks to me in rich, powerful, wonderful ways. There's, there's some intangible experience in the glories of creation that speak to the deep parts of the human heart. Going back to that fast creation it stirs fascination with God. And the memory of those things brings hope and healing. Now, I've had people say, well, Russell, I'm just not that deep. I'm just not that deep of a person. Frankly, I, I don't buy that. I think most of us keep hidden depths in our hearts that don't get ever shared or maybe don't even get explored. But hear this. There are deep things of the Holy Spirit that call out and call to you. And the sorrows and the bringing the sorrows to the Lord may very well be a pathway that unlocks those hidden depths of the human heart and instills within us this confidence. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. That is a word of hope. That in your sorrows, the Lord is with you. The Lord directs his love. The Lord sings his love to you. That is a word of hope for the sorrowing heart. Interestingly, the, the psalm continues. After that, you know, kind of, I would normally stop it. If I were the writer, I would have stopped it here because I think that seven and eight are pretty powerful and wonderful and rich. But no, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Remember what I said earlier about the ups and downs are an expected part of the spiritual life? The downs come back even again. We go from the heights of these spiritual experiences, but then the feelings of sorrow and abandonment, they do come back. And so I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? And, and this verse 10 is so cap captivating to me. My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Now, that sounds mildly 
mildly like the kind of agonies that Christ suffered on the cross. Bones suffering mortal agony. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great 20th century pastor and theologian, he wrote a little book about the Psalms, you know, t talking about praying the Psalms. One of the things that he says is that when, when you're praying the Psalms, uh, Christ is the fulfillment of all the Psalms. Indeed, Christ is the only one that can pray the Psalms with complete honesty. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a, a different thing. But he points to how Christ is the fulfillment of all the Psalms. And with this line, with this verse 10, that puts me right in mind of the resurrection. This, uh, or not the, the crucifixion. The sufferings of Christ. Christ, you suffered, died, was rejected, was lonely. Christ is a man of sorrows. And so in this verse, it leads me to remember the man of sorrows, the man who was acquainted with grief. That part of the astonishing truth of the triune living God is that God took on flesh and became one of us to identify with us in our sorrows so that, so that we know somebody understands. And because part of sorrows is not nobody can really grasp this. Christ knows. He knows abandonment. He knows betrayal. He knows loss and grief. He knows agony and anguish. And so in our sorrows, we then connect with Christ in a powerful way. And that connects us with hope. Because on the other side of Christ's sufferings, on the other side of the cross and the betrayal and the, and the, and the torture and the abandonment by friends, what happens on the other side of that? What happens on the other side of that? Resurrection. Friday is awful. Friday is a day of suffering and pain and horror. But in the words of Tony Campolo, Sunday is coming. There may be weeping for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And that is the lesson that I get from our sorrows. That this world is a world of suffering. We're not going to fix it through our cleverness. But resurrection and renewal is coming. Life is challenging. Life is difficult. But resurrection is coming. And then it, he, the psalmist lands the plane. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why it's so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. That which you have said in place, that was accidentally a little bit of last month's, um, last week's scripture. Ignore that. It ends with my Savior and my God. And um, uh, he ends once again. All this up and down, up and down, up and down. He ends with confidence. I think to close this, let me just share with you some lyrics from my great hero, Michael Card. Michael Card, singer, songwriter, um, brilliant mind. Uh, we've had him here in Cincinnati a couple of times. C.S. Lewis Institute brought him in for a, uh, a, a conference a couple of years ago. And he has, he has a whole album about suffering called The Hidden Face of God. Um, he wrote a book that goes along with it, um, and it is incredibly powerful. And he talks about the power of our sufferings to connect more deeply with God. And he has one song, I commend it to you, called Come Lift Up Your Sorrows. The opening lyrics, if you're wounded, if you're alone, if you're angry, if your heart is cold as stone, if you have fallen, if you were weak, come find the worth of God that only the suffering seek. And then he goes right into the chorus. Come lift up your sorrows. Come offer your pain. Come make a sacrifice of all your shame. There 
in the wilderness, he's waiting for you to worship him with your wounds, for he is wounded too. The power of our sorrows, the power to connect with the wounds of Christ. And we worship Christ with our wounds. We experience a deeper, richer hope of the joy that comes in the morning. So we're going to take a few minutes. We're going to abide with the Lord. What's the Lord been saying to you all through this worship service? It doesn't have to be through the sermon. It could be through anything. What's the Lord been saying with you, to you? What's one small step of faith that he's calling you to take today? Let's be still and abide with the Lord. Let's stand and sing our final song.
destroyed. I am blessed beyond the cursed forest promised John and Dor. His joy is gonna be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes with the morning. Now, my friends, go in grace, and go in mercy, and go in peace. May the living Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forevermore.